long here and to welcome you here. We look forward to hearing from our friend David Osterholt today. Next week, we will hear from Julia Metcalf. The week after that, Solomon Suma, and closing with Anna Milligan the last Sunday in June. So I hope that you all can set aside some time each of the next three weeks to be inspired and motivated by the words that we'll hear from each of our friends. I would like to call Jim Miller up to open us with prayer, and we'll look forward to hearing what David has to share with us. Thank you, Judith, very much. Uh, this is one of the happiest times of this community where we gather in June to listen into what the Lord is doing and what the Lord has done in the lives of those that we love and we care about here. Those of you who may be here for the first time or those of you who are coming back uh, to hear a little bit of a story that will be encouraging to all of us, a warm and hearty welcome to each of you. I'm really glad to have uh, Bruce Lytle's family, his daughter Michelle, and this beautiful family sits right here. Bruce Lytle, of course, was married to Elsie Lytle, and uh, Bruce was one who famously went to the balcony in the back and through computer technology was able to get a picture of the cross of Jesus and the face of Jesus from the window in the middle of that cross. And this is all on his own. He made postcards. And in these postcards, talks about the, the face of Christ is present in the midst of every suffering that we know. Absolutely beautiful. So, Michelle, for you and your team to be here, it's a really an honor to welcome you back. Uh, Bruce died 10 years ago, which was kind of a shock to me. I could not have told you that. I'm also thankful for... Uh, where did they go? There they are. <laughs> kind of hard to miss, David. Yeah, kind of hard to miss. We're honored, we're thankful, and we are eager to listen. Yeah, let's pray together. Lord, in just a moment, we will be standing to sing the prayer that you've taught us to pray. And in that simple short prayer the entire span of life exists we are mindful of your presence we're mindful of the ways that you can actually assist and engage us when we make requests for daily bread when we recognize that relationships are out of joint we can confess our sin thank you for the prayer you invite us to join together singing and I thank you for the hearts that prompt us to sing that prayer today in the persons of uh, of David and Elsie and the beauty of their life together your faithfulness in the midst of it all that's the message that will come through loud and clear to us so in the quiet of this house of prayer. Uh, we stand together, if you would please, and we join together in singing the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray together. <laughs>
our first reading from the Apostle Paul, chapter 12, verse 9. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may come to rest on me. rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace we have been saved and he has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. For by grace we have been saved through faith. And this is not our own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of our works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Uh-huh. Want to have a seat, David, just for a minute? Yep. This could go on for some time, <laughs> this introduction. I'm actually going to be very brief in my introduction. I'm honored that David would invite me to offer a brief introduction to a man that many of us don't need to be introduced to. But I've been privileged to walk alongside David and Elsie during times of great joy and times of deep sorrow. I was at the hospital in Oklahoma City when diagnosis came unexpectedly. I was here in this sanctuary, uh, both for the services of Bruce and uh, the Lytle family. And then I was here when Elsie and David were married, right here in this sanctuary, and one of these great, unexpected, beautiful gifts that land like manna in our laps from the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, this beautiful added gift that David is so easy and uh, eager to speak about. I'll never forget, it's never happened to me in any wedding I've ever conducted in 45 years, that he read an apology to his family. He read a confessional statement about the divorce that had happened years earlier. And his desire in sharing that publicly, which had been shared personally, was the hope that transparency would be the foundation stone of this relationship that the Lord has given him and Elsie. I don't think there was a dry eye in the place. I know mine were not. And so I came to know a man who yearns to be authentic in his faith, is willing to talk about getting in the batter's box, you might say, and swinging and missing, has encountered the grace of God in Jesus Christ in a way that allows him to look to the future with hope and a steadfast assurance, and then who speaks so easily about love given and received, both vertically and horizontally. You go into his home, you see the gift that God has given him as an artist. Sometimes I'll look at those paintings and I'll say, now, are you sure that's not a photograph? I say, no, that's a painting, I painted that. So he has this gift of realism in painting. I love that he titled his talk today, Paint This, Paint This. I could go along, I could do a preaching series on that, Paint 
paint this. But I'll, I'll end with this. First of all, I love you very much. I'm very grateful to each of you. Elsie, your faithfulness and love for David and for Bruce, uh, your kindness in walking hand in hand with these two men that the Lord has blessed you with is a witness to everybody. And David will be one who will be very quick to, to share that, I'm sure. Psalm 139, this is the God that David and Elsie both know. It's the God that we yearn to come to know better. Oh Lord, you have searched me and you've known me. You know my lying down, you know my rising up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all of my ways. Where shall I flee from your presence, O Lord? Where shall I go from your spirit? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, the place of the dead, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and flee to the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, even the morning is becoming dark, Darkness is as light to you, O Lord. You come steadfastly. You uphold me in your mercy and by your grace. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of listening to a story. It's your story, really. And you have worked in and through this story to enable David to speak with gladness of your grace and goodness, even in the midst of all the challenges that have been past, present, and who knows, maybe future. There's a faithful witness to listen to, and in this witness we will find a compelling story, an authentic story, an honest story that points to your goodness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's greet David Osterholt. Well, thank you, Jim. That was more than adequate. In some ways, it seems inappropriate or wrong that I should stand here today and speak of my life. I was given so much, and for some reason, I seemed to waste it. Um, there were so many others, perhaps seated here today, who may have had difficulties that make my experience pale by comparison. Nevertheless, it is what it is. So forgive me while I ramble on. Our Lord's grace has seen me through. It is indeed an honor to be here this morning. For me, ends always met. I ate, I stayed warm, and I was kept safe. I wouldn't consider myself to be a safe person, anything but. I know in my heart, without question, that I was kept that way. It may be as simple as being baptized that gave me a leg up. So, the formative years, or more accurately, the informative years, the wanting of things as a child, candy, toys, bicycles, had it. A large contingent of neighborhood kids to run with, had it. Freedom, check. Well, what could go wrong? Learn to fight, play with matches, smoke corn silk, learn to cuss, a full list of stories and adventures that they fed my imagination, for sure. My parents had met in Montevideo, Minnesota. My grandfather, Osterholt, ran dime stores in town. My mother, Louise, had landed a job there as a young lady after her family had first tried to homestead near Haver, Montana. Everything, of course, dried up. Anna Schmidt, my grandmother's Mennonite family, had come from somewhere around the Black Sea, and her family had originally immigrated to Kansas. She became Lutheran after finding herself in Haver with my grandfather, Hawken Johnson. Haver was, a Luth was Lutheran or Catholic, Grandpa was not interested in learning Latin. 
English was hard enough. He had immigrated from Norway as a young boy. Not long afterward, he, had sent, he was sent back to fight in World War I. Both my grandparents, my grandfathers, liked to fish. I remember one ap afternoon, Grandpa Johnson and I went for crappies and sunfish. I cleaned 136 of them. My hands were incredibly sore. I would put those fish in milk cartons and flood them with water and into the freezer now that they had one. They took care of what they had, and it wasn't much. My mom and dad, as Christians, were married in a Methodist church in Minneapolis. Dad soon started an advertising agency in the early 50s, mostly industrial accounts and business to business. His brother Ted working in advertising in Chicago. That's where he was. There was another uncle, my uncle Bob, who had perished in a naval training accident over Pensacola, Florida. I never met him, of course, but I never want those guys to ever be forgotten. A real heartache for my dad, and that subsequently put him in a foster home as a result of his parents' divorce and his mother being devastated. That provided us yet with another set of loving grandparents, Bill and Zeta Slip, such a blessing. My mom did some bookkeeping for people and for dad's agency as well. She was pretty much home, taking care of us kids. It was me, my younger sister Liz, and my brother Robert, named after my dad's brother, of course. So then, childhood, it was amazing. Low tech, no tech, no area codes for, zip, for uh, phone lines, no zip codes for mail. It was the early 50s. My folks bought a house for about 11 grand in a big housing development in the Burbs. That's where all the fun began. All of us, all kinds of kids, unsupervised for the most part, we would take off on our bikes and be gone for hours and hours, build forts of all kinds. Dissect salamanders, toads, and frogs. We'd crawl way up sewer drains along the new freeway going in right behind our house. That was 35W. I'd ride on, on earth-moving equipment when the drivers would offer. On the bridges were men throwing red-hot rivets. We'd be out there, too. Older kids were being political and forming groups that we needed to be a part of. One night, they decided to burn some kid in effigy because he didn't fit in. It wasn't racial, it was just stupid copycat behavior. I wanted nothing to do with it. I can still see the smoke from my bedroom window. Across the farmer's field, I wondered why someone could be so hateful. The field wasn't very large, corn. It's where we got the silk to smoke. Somewhere in all of this, I was beginning to understand that there were different churches people would attend. I'd get invited to Williamson's house on a Friday night and it was always fish. They said grace, different than the way we said grace. Grace was mandatory at that time, everywhere. Summers were grand, trips to various lakes. I was told I ran off the end of the dock when I was, when I was about two or three. Their water was way over my head, of course, and my mom fished me out. As I mentioned, my grandfather on my dad's side ran five and 10 cent stores in the upper Midwest. It was old school. There were candy counters, toy, toys and soda fountains, parakeets, finches, painted turtles, all access, baby. Grandpa would fix that mechanical horse, Sandy, to run for an hour, dyed chicks, bunnies, and ducklings at Easter time. He knew how to bring people into the store. I would go with him in his car to Brainerd from Bloomington, about a four or five hour trip back then. It was great fun. He would hide quarters under the seats and all around the inside of his car, a beautiful 56 Pontiac. Finding those quarters would keep me occupied where he stopped at some watering hole along the way. I was probably about seven. Sister Liz made the trip one year and Grandpa Osterholt took us fishing, bait, beer, and soda hanging off the side of the boat to keep it cold. We had to be quiet as to not to scare the fish. No fish finders or GPS back then. I would be running the anchor, up, down, up, down. Get enough fish for supper was the plan. We lived in that Minneapolis suburb of Bloomington for about 10 years. Away from school or home or church, 
I may as well have been raised by wolves. A neighbor might be butchering chickens. Headless, they would run. Always a highlight. Some of us, playing with matches, burnt down a garage that belonged to the nearby Lutheran church. Cops showed up at my door that day, on that day. I remember knocking some kid's teeth out on our dead-end street. Or the day Ralph Anderson decided to put a 22 shell in a vise and hit it with a hammer. Bows and arrows, slingshots and pea shooters. Fourth of July, we were blowing up mailboxes. On Halloween, bring a bar of soap. Soon I began to realize that some of us were getting bigger than others. A useful thing to know. Suddenly I was made to be cautious, be funny, negotiate, get my nose bloodied, or bloody somebody else's. Quit Cub Scouts after one such event. Joined Indian Guides. The YMCA Indian Guides program that was developed in a deliberate way to support a father's vital role as a teacher, counselor, and friend to his son. We settled on Big Crow and Little Crow for our official Indian names. Authentic, right? Not. Well, talk about ritual with a capital R. We had become members of the Portland Avenue Methodist Church. I had to go every Sunday. You can only imagine how this would interrupt all that I had going on. I think that is where I was beginning to learn the difference between ceremony and that which was truly sacred. There were Sunday school classes to attend and then our church service, go home to Sunday dinner with guests arriving often. Friends or family, professional acquaintances, clients or employees of the agency. One of the employees was a woman married to a Presbyterian pastor at a little church in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Evelyn Emerson was her name. Evelyn was married to the Reverend Arthur Emerson. We would go out to his little church occasionally, you know, the little white wooden church with the tall steeple. There was a coal-fired furnace, and he would light it to heat the place, but it was always cold. You'd get enough bodies in there singing, and the coats would start to come off. Warm and welcome, the potluck and desserts after the service were pretty good, too. Grade school. Well, never made it to kindergarten, stepped right into the first grade not knowing a thing. Had the hardest time learning to read. Hated it. Couldn't begin to add or subtract. Teachers were glad to move me along to the next level of incompetence. Yep. Walked to school for the first six years, unless it was really bad, praying always for a big snowstorm, enough to cancel school. Had a paper route, too, but the weather would never cooperate. Bad report cards. Dad especially would grill me over and over, and I still didn't get it. He was frustrated and let me know it. He loved me, but it was difficult, a difficult thing to understand when I was always in trouble. School would let out in the spring, always the best day of my life. And the first thing that would happen is that I would have been told that I was going to Bible school for two weeks, an eternity, at the Methodist Church. And one day I locked myself in the bathroom and I announced I wasn't going, and my mother was furious. After some years, all of this was soon to come to an end. After visiting the Presbyterian Church in Eden Prairie a few times and driving around the area, my folks decided to buy a place out that way. The community was rural, and I was about 12, and I didn't know a soul. There was a nearby farmhouse with some kids I soon got to know, a rent house, and three boys living there who were dirt poor. We became friends and spent time mostly shooting things. With a gun club nearby and the and in the early spring, we could go out and pick up hundreds of missed clay targets. After landing in the snow, they'd be unbroken. We'd take a hand trap and then go out and just shoot them up. One sad day, the boys' dads told him, told them, to those boys' dad, told them to dispatch a black lab that they had had for many years. He was off to work. So there were these three boys de digging this deep grave with tears in their eyes. It still makes me sick to think about it. Somewhere I had learned compassion, church, no doubt, and it broke my heart. I offered to do the deed, but they said no. There were other young people I met soon after school started in the fall. 
I would now ride the bus to school, and it took forever. One stop, and here comes Larry. Larry was and still is a good friend. We kind of grew up together. He came from a large Catholic family. I still tease him about being a bad influence on my life. I, in turn, was very much the same for him. Trouble, trouble, trouble. He lived about a mile from us. Bicycles were a thing until we got to start driving. Larry landed a job with the local veterinarian about another mile or two up the road in Glen Lake. Soon I would work there as well. We were rich. Starting salary was $1.10 an hour. Gas money. I had an Uncle Al who had served in the Air Force and did 50 mission trips in Europe during the war. So many stories, my dad said it was all true. He and my Aunt Hilma, my mom's sister, had a bunch of kids and Al provided well for his family. Spoiled them rotten. Al was from Texas. He had mentioned to my dad many years ago that he thought Tulsa would be a great place to retire. My dad's brother, Ted, worked for my dad for a short time. He came up from Chicago and was married to a woman named Joan. Joan was in ill health. I loved my Uncle Ted. He was so talented. Ted gave me the best advice ever when I became an art director. It was when I was in my latter years, and it was quite simple. Be good and be fast. I knew what he meant. Ted was bored with the industrial accounts Dad had, and I think he missed his home turf in Chicago. After moving back there, he and another guy started a design studio. I remember making trips to Chicago. When I was 15, my dad had to fly down for business, and I, want, I was asked if I'd like to go. When I was there, Ted asked me one evening if I wanted a cigarette. I was already smoking, and I said, sure. Next thing you know, I'm flying back with my dad on the airplane, smoking along with everyone else. Dad said not to flaunt it in front of my mother. I didn't, not for a while anyway. I made trips to Chicago alone after that as well. Ted's office was right near the Art Institute. Ted, it turns out, had studied there and knew his stuff, and it rubbed off. My Uncle Ted and I developed a friendship, and later in life, I would we would write letters and talk on the phone quite frequently. He was a devout Catholic. I had a huge respect for anything that he felt was of value. The holiday parties and the open houses that Dad's agency held were off the chart. These guys all knew how to go first class. I got my nose rubbed in it. Reality was for other people, or so it seemed. I grew up in a hurry. My perception of reality was distorted, to say the least. I was in way over my head. Prior to all that, the Presbyterian Church in Eden Prairie had their eyes set on me for confirmation. I was the new kid in the eighth grade. Girls had become a thing. I had taken some classes learning watercolors out on Lake Minnetonka. Lake Minnetonka was a huge body of water. A lot of snooty people lived out there, and there was a huge amusement park on the lake a dance floor, and once the Rolling Stones came to play, and I could dance. The world was changing fast, and pop culture was upon us. Kennedy was assassinated, and Vietnam was nightly news. I took summer courses at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. I did odd jobs at my dad's agency, painting file cabinets and things like that. I got to know the guys working in the art department, and I loved art. One of them, Harold, took an interest in my thoughts about art. He had a master's from the University of Iowa, very talented and really a dry wit. Harold and his wife, Bonnie, took me to see Sweet Emma and the Preservation Hall Band at the Guthrie one night. The place was rocking. They played A Closer Walk With Thee, and everyone was on their feet. I had never heard a funeral march like that. I always thought it would have been a fun hymn at a wedding, when the groom comes down the aisle. Ron Pearson wouldn't go for it. Yep, I did ask. Maybe, maybe I could get Mary Melody at my funeral. Well, that's all, folks, bird whistle and all. My grades in high school were awful, but in art I could flourish. The lady who taught art set me up in the back room with all the materials I ever needed. I could go to town. Thank you, Mrs. Stewart. She would have temper temper tantrums, and the kids knew how to really get her started. 
I had to stay out of it, but boy, she really went off the deep end and would start yelling about what dolts we all were. I got a pass. She. Nevertheless, it seemed like I was always in trouble all the time. My dad threatened to send me to the boys' home near where we lived. He was so, it was so frustrating for him, but he never, ever gave up on me. There were 110 kids in my high school graduating class. Somehow, I got to be one of them. One of the guys I graduated with had a sister. She was a year older and was good looking. So when her brother went off to Vietnam, I made it a, a point to go see how she was doing and get the latest scoop on her brother. A romance blossomed and soon we were to be married. We got ahead of ourselves and were about to become three. We were very much in love and I was thrown into a role that, well, I was not ready. Nothing can prepare anyone for what happens when you see your child for the first time. I am blessed to this, this day for my beautiful daughter, Andrea. It was time to start thinking about work. We had a lot of support. My wife's family were amazing people. They belonged to the same Presbyterian church as my family. My father-in-law was a good friend and we spent hours working together. I learned a lot from him. My career started immediately after finishing college. We needed the money. The only reason I was accepted to MCAD, the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, was my portfolio. I was on probation until I could prove myself academically. I was soon on the dean's list and stayed there for about four years. I was motivated and worked hard. We struggled, put 750 miles a week on our car, and, worked, and I worked in a paper mill during the summers to make some dough. 10 hours a day, seven days a week, and if somebody didn't show up for the next shift, you were on. Triple time on holidays, it was all union, hot as hell working underneath the dryers. I had a bucket loader, a pitchfork, and would pick up hot, wet, brown craft paper that would come spewing off the roller, rollers at about 1,000 feet per minute. Quite a mess, and about the time you got it cleaned up, it would break all over again. Tough place to work but I made good money. Not much praying going on during that time. We worked and worked some more. After college, I landed my first job as an art director for a local furniture store. I took the pictures, did the illustrations, wrote the copy, bought the media, and scheduled the space. That lasted for about six months. Next job was a little less diversified, but not for long. I would become a key liner at a direct mail marketing company worked for some, a tough boss that knew his stuff. I was doing paste-ups for all kinds of products. Apparently, he thought I had the right stuff. It wasn't long after that I was running the department. They brought me along. I was moved up to doing layouts and became a full-blooded art director and was treated as such. Type salesmen, printers, studio heads would come and take us all to lunch. It was a three-martini lunch. It was the 70s and the hours were long. Then my dad, after seeing that I had produced some good work, offered me a job at his agency. It was a lateral move and I could settle down a bit. It felt good for a while, but I could see very soon that I would never become his equal. His business partner was managing the art department and I had to report to that guy. He was good, I was third fiddle. I stayed for a while, three years at least, then started looking. There was a major company with worldwide headquarters looking for help. I applied and got the job. I was so glad to have my own identity back, whatever that was. I was back into the fray. Long hours. I, I was acting as a creative head by then. The budget seemed to be without end. No pressure, right? A lot of good work, good people, and more. I was traveling and dealing with top-tier talent on a national level. Thousands of deadlines. I do not want to get in to all that happened during that decade. But it was enough to wear me out, end my marriage, and change my life. A lot of personal counseling ensued. I would disappoint the people I loved. I left in a state of exhaustion. The economy had dried up and no one was hiring. I went to California and looked for work. My sister lived in Irvine by then. No luck, so back to Minnesota, where a long-standing company took me on to work in their marketing department, this time in St. Paul. 
once again an art director, and this time in a place where creatives go to die. It was a service job, and it was secure, and it was stable. Annual reviews, annual salary increases, vacations, and benefits. There was child support to pay, and I was on my own. No future plans at that point, and the stability put me to sleep. I was numb. 17 years of working there. I could walk to work, walk home, or stop at a bar on the way home. Had a beautiful apartment on the 17th floor downtown, and drinking had become a way of life. By the grace of God, at some point here, I had joined a big Presbyterian church in St. Paul. Steeped in tradition, it made sense to me. I was struggling with alcoholism, and there were people there praying for me. My daughter, Andrea, had gone off to college. She spent her junior year in France, and I prayed for her constantly. This was before cell phones and FaceTime. I was able to visit her, and to this day, I am incredibly proud of Andrea. I had the father of the bride experience when she returned home to finish college and subsequently marry a wonderful young man named Todd Kennedy. Together they raised two beautiful boys, Jack and Bo, beautiful young men now, and my prayers are in answered indeed. Meanwhile, after some time in St. Paul, I bought a townhome across town. Back in Eden Prairie, I could make the commute and be back in my own in my old stomping grounds in time for happy hour. I was turning into a grumpy old man. One day I asked my daughter Andrea to come and watch my place. I had some service work to be done. She could see that I had gone through a lot of beer after having been there the day before. She said, Dad, you have to quit. And so I did. How it happens that anyone quits drinking is beyond me. Just know that because, I just know that because I loved Andrea so much that if she asked me to do anything, I couldn't refuse. It wasn't easy. I had to have some surgery on my shoulder and there would be pain pills involved in recovery. I think I used those pills to help me quit and quit smoking as well. Once I got past a couple of weeks, there was no going back. I wanted to quit but didn't know how. You gotta wanna quit for it to work. There, is, there was no going back for me. I had to learn to cope with everything all over again. Then this happened. I was working and work orders were piling up on my desk. Some production coordinator came in and demanded I drop what I was doing and finish something that was high on her agenda. I was irritated that creatives were being routed out by production managers and said it wasn't possible. Well, for some reason, I got sent to the department head, and he started telling me of my responsibilities, like I didn't know. I told him pretty much I had had it. Angry, I said I didn't like the way they treated the creatives, and with a lot of profanity, walked out. That was it. It was that, or start drinking again. There was no going back. I hated my job, hated him, and I hated my life. I hated life in general at that point. I drove home back to Eden Prairie and near where that old gun club used to be, there was a lake. It was April. I walked around that lake so many times that day, I re repeated the Lord's Prayer over and over and over again and again. I prayed, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm not doing this again, ever. It was so, it was, so it was, shortly after my first grandson, Jack, was born, that I had quit drinking, a commitment I have kept to this day. Well, with that, life started over again. The condo was soon up for sale. Mom and Dad had moved to Owasso, of all places. I followed after trying to find work in Dallas. I had nowhere else to be, so I bought my own place here in Tulsa. How bad could it be? And Mom and Dad could certainly use my help. Miracles started happening again. My place was paid for. It needed work, and I had time to start some fine art as well. The budget was getting thin, and I was hoping to find work. I had a cousin who lived in, near Ada, my Uncle Al's daughter, and by the grace of God, she and her then-husband were opening an office in Tulsa to sell some long-term health insurance. They needed help with marketing, and I was the guy. 
That work went on for a few years, and in time, I was granted health care insurance. The angels were busy. I had some prescriptions that needed to be taken care of and needed to find a doctor. As a part of that routine health care, I had a physical and, and an electrocardiogram. Further tests indicated heart problems. I needed a quadruple heart bypass, and it was a rush. They scheduled me for surgery a few days later. I had been out schlepping railroad ties just a week earlier in my backyard, and just imagine the timing of that health insurance benefit. The Lord was watching. My sister Liz was living in Frisco, Texas with her husband Jim, whom she met in California. She jumped at the chance to help me through my surgery. A week or so later, daughter Andrea came down to stay and help me recover. My mom and dad had had enough on their plate by then as well. Mom was having health problems of her own. Her mobility was becoming more difficult. I was there to help, but it was my dad that did everything. He adored my mother. My folks would watch First Presbyterian broadcasts on television. We were, after all, Presbyterian. Dad was an elder in the Presbyterian church, and once an elder, always an elder, and faith was at work. In late September 2009, Mom went to be with the Lord. I called First Church during her last days in the hospital. I explained my situation, and the response was simple. What room is she in? Within an hour, excuse me, someone was there. Prayers, comfort, compassion. It was beautiful. Shortly after she passed, First Presbyterian handled her memorial, and it was lovely. So it was then I knew I needed to get back to worship. I joined this beautiful congregation. I can't believe what has begun to happen or what has happened since. So many friendships. But the stunner, of course, was meeting Elsie and getting married. Our wedding was November 1st, 2014, All Saints Day for a reason, for all those that have gone before us, all of them. Life was going to be great, and many of you know our story. These are my wristbands, and there you'll see them in that container as well. There's a pile of them. I brought them to help illustrate some of what we've been through, hospital stays, chemotherapy, transfusions, hydration, and multiple surgeries, not to mention all the trips to the Cancer Center and Mayo Clinic. So much more. We'll show you after our final hymn what our Lord has done with these beautiful memories, painful memories. So after we were married, a year and a half later to be exact, I was diagnosed with AML, acute myeloid leukemia. Elsie was in Wichita that week. I was home with a terrible chest cold and felt off, intense coughing and a fever. Friday night, Elsie arrived home. She thought we should go to urgent care immediately, and I said, of course, wait till morning. The next day, we were off to urgent care. I was sent immediately across the street to the ICU at St. Francis. It, was, it wasn't just pneumonia. I was so sick when this bombshell landed with a deafening thud. The doctor came in and said something like, well, 100 people walk in here with this, and 30 walk out. What was he talking about? We weren't having it. I was put in an ambulance and sent to Oklahoma City. We spent three months there during late summer. I was given round after round of chemotherapy, cytarabine and iterubicin. I was in remission for about three years. And that three years was not a cakewalk either. My blood counts began to take a dive. We made our way to Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. We reviewed our options while they prepped me for the prospect of an allogeneic transplant. That's the stem cells from another person. More chemo, and I was finally back into remission. Everyone we met going through the same experience had perished. We have come to know a lot of widows. Elsie and I decided, after much prayer, to go home and try to just maintain a good quality of life. We put it all in God's hands. A palliative care doctor at Mayo told me to go home and get my affairs in order, and that's a hard thing to hear. 
Typically, AML will return in roughly half the length of time from the last remission. There were countless trips to the cancer center here. My blood count numbers started to decline after 18 months and the cancer was back. There, was, there is no cure for this illness, but possibly, by the grace of God, a transplant. We returned to Mayo. There, we were told it would be only a matter of time, about nine months before it would return again. The decision had been made for us. Transplant was the only choice we had. Go big or go home. I was ready. This church was praying for me. I was back on the prayer list, and Dr. Miller had formally anointed me with oil. Our ruling elders and deacons had blessed our path going forward. This same God, whom from baptism cared for me, was caring for me once again. My stem cell transplant was December 23rd, 2021. The cells came from a 28-year-old male living in Great Britain, a perfect match. Thank you to a long list of doctors, especially Dr. Katab of Tulsa and Dr. William Hogan of Mayo Clinic. But more importantly, thank you, Lord. I am one year and five months in remission. I got to get to Christmas. It'll be the two-year mark, which typically indicates a high rate of success. Host versus graft is the fear. We trust in the Lord now for whatever happens. Elsie and I are here for better or for worse. I wouldn't be here without my Elsie. We remain in God's hands. I love this woman. And together we love the Lord. So my life, in spite of so much pushback, ignorance, irreverence, anger, jealousy, hate, prejudice, indifference, sadness, addiction, foolishness, you name it, the Lord, he would not leave me. Guilty I stand and believe by him I am forgiven. I have learned to forgive myself as well, almost. This understanding comes largely from this place and Dr. Miller. Thank you, Jim. To the people who came in and out of my life, you helped me to move through some tough times. Thank you for your grace and your prayers. This is the stuff of miracles. Now I wanna, I wanna say something. Jesus does love me. It's not so much that the Bible tells me so like it does in a child's prayer, or child's hymn. It's more like I had to find out for myself. And by God's grace, I believe I have. So with that, thank you all so much for being here today. And now, our final hymn.
these memories could go into the dustbin of life and stay there. Gracious God, we thank you for the reminder from the hymn that we just sang. We have no one to fear with you at hand to bless. Ills have no weight, tears no bitterness. Where is death sting? Where grave thy victory? We triumph still if you, knowing that you abide with each of us. Go with us now, Lord. Guide us, guard us, show us your way. Work by the power of your Holy Spirit in and through us for your glory. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen. Amen. amen.